And then when the invasion started, all our partners from different countries told, we will provide you evacuation transport, we will give you money for relocate, please evacuate, please stay alive, please. And I always respond, don't ask us to evacuate, help us to resist. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, June 10th, 2022. Oleksandra Matvichuk is the head of the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine. She founded the organization to work on internal reform in her own country, but for the last eight years has spent a great deal of her time investigating and documenting Russian war crimes. She began this way before it was cool, in the wake of the 2014 Russian invasion of the Donbass and Crimea, but the work has really accelerated since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of this year. She is in Washington this week talking to U.S. policymakers about her vision of a hybrid tribunal to try Russian war crimes, and she stopped by the Goat Rodeo Studios to chat with me. It's a wide-ranging conversation covering her own history as a war crimes investigator and documenter, the current challenge of documenting and prosecuting Russian war crimes on a scale we haven't seen in a very long time, and how the Ukrainian war effort relates to the project of defending civilians and preventing further war crimes. It's the Lawfare Podcast, June 10th, Oleksandra Matvichuk on documenting Russian war crimes in Ukraine. Let's start by having you introduce yourself. Talk a little bit about your background and about the organization that you run and how you came to be here in Washington. My name is Oleksandra Matvichuk. I'm a human rights defender, head of Center for Civil Liberties. It's a human rights organization based in Kiev uh, who was established in 2007, but we work not only across Ukraine, but also have a very close ties with uh, human rights defenders from Russia, from Moldova, from Poland, from Kazakhstan, and other countries of the OCE region. I'm here for the invitation of National Endowment for Democracy for the award ceremony together with my other three colleagues from different fields. And how I decided uh, to st uh, start uh, work as a human rights defender, uh, maybe it uh, was a uh, very easy decision. Uh, Ukraine is a nation of in transit. And uh, we still uh, fighting for the rights to have a chance to build a country where rights of everybody are protected, government is accountable, judiciary is independent, and police uh, do not beat students who are peacefully demonstrating. And when I was a pupil, I uh, wrote a lot of historical literature about Soviet past. And I was uh, suddenly a good understanding that this past is very close. And this injustice it's happened when I was a child, because I was born on the time of Soviet Union. And this understanding that this horror with the injustice, with the terror, with the persecution was so close even during my life, bring me to the point that I have to fight for justice and for freedom. So when Americans hear the name uh, of your organization, it sounds like the American Civil Liberties Union or the, you know, a, a sort of traditional in the American, to the American ear, it sounds like a civil liberties organization. Yet you spend most of your time investigating foreign war crimes against Ukraine, not sort of domestic civil liberties issues. Did the organization start as a more traditional civil liberties organization or was it always focused on Russia and foreign aggression? No, uh, we wasn't always focused only on Russia. Russia started this war in 2014. And that uh, we opened a new direction of our work 
Uh, and this direction was about documentation of war crimes uh, in Donbas and monitoring of political persecution in occupied Crimea. But parallel, uh, we uh, do a lot of work in order to transfer Ukraine because it's very important to build independent democratic institutions. Our organization was deeply involved in judiciary reform, in uh, security reform, reform of police. I myself was the author of program for new policemen about human rights. And when we started the reform of police, I myself uh, was a teacher to police uh, about human rights. And it was a very interesting experience because when this reform started and after several months a new policeman appeared in the street, I was in a very interesting uh, mood because before I tried to avoid police on the street. Just in case, because I know about police brutality, about problems which uh, and human rights violation in detention centers of police. But then I was regularly stopped on the street by police and they told me, Alexandra Vyacheslavivna, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, maybe you don't remember us, but you was our teacher. So that was before 2014, or did that activity continue even after the change in focus? I suppose it started to be possible only after 2014, because after 2014, after Revolution of Dignity, we uh, obtained a chance to provide a democratic reform. Before, we have authoritarian regime, which was very close to Russia. And this was the Yanukovych regime. Yes, exactly. And when Yanukovych, um, he left country and hiding in Russia, and we obtained a chance to do this uh, democratic transformation, Russia started this war because Putin is not afraid of NATO. Putin is afraid of the idea of freedom, which come closer to the border. So before, the, before February... How much of your activity was focused on uh, domestic Ukrainian reform? How much of it was focused on documenting war crimes from 2014? What was the balance like before the, the full invasion? We uh, try to precisely focus on reforms because we understood very clearly that this war has a very distinct value dimension. And we win this war not only when we deoccupy Crimea and Donbas, but when we will be able to build a sustainable democratic institutions. But it's very hard to speak about balance and fulfilling the strategy when you are human beings and you deal with human pain. And to be honest, uh, sometimes like individual cases took all of us our time. Because when you are reached by relatives of hostages who have no other hope, no other chance to release their beloved one, and you as a human rights lawyer also understand, okay, you know, UN system, OEC system, Council of U Europe system, but there is no algorithm what you have to do to release them. It's very difficult to concentrate uh, on reforming process and not to respond to such a request of help. And that's why it uh, took from us enormous amount of time. So starting in 2014, you start working on war crimes documentation. Tell us about the experience of 2014 to February before we get to the full-scale invasion. We have eight years of your work doing documentation, what did you guys do and what came of it? Uh, I maybe even make one step back because during the Revolution of Dignity, I coordinated civil initiative Yevromaidan SOS. And we brought up several thousands of volunteers, several hundreds of lawyers who work pro bono. And uh, we work 24 hours a day and provide legal and other aid to prosecuted protesters across the country. And every day, hundreds and hundreds of people who were beaten, who were arrested, who were accused uh, uh, in fabricated criminal charge passed through our care. And then when authoritarian regime collapse, 
it was very easy for us to organize mobile group and to send them to Crimea and Donbas, where something started happening. And I remember very clearly that it was the day after this uh, horrible shooting, massive shooting of unarmed protesters in the center of Kiev. And we equipped the mobile groups with knowledge and uh, instructions. And we really don't underst- didn't understand that the war has already begun. Because I remember you that Russians pretend that they are not there. Uh, they, uh, the, the green, the un- little green man, little yes. green man appeared. Nobody understand what's going on. Now it uh, looks very rational. Okay, the authoritarian regime collapse for sure. Russia will intervene, but for that moment, as from human rights, no, from human beings' point of view, it was unbelievable that such gesture can be done by neighbor country. And uh, then uh, working with mobile groups on the ground, uh, under shellings, uh, under constant threats to be kidnapped, we uh, start to concentrate our efforts for documenting war crimes and uh, political motivated prosecutions. And my personal focus was uh, practice of illegal abduction, torture, sexual violence, and killing civilians. And I personally spoke with more than 100 people who survived in captivity. So you you personally interviewed more than 100 survivors of Russian captivity from Donbass and Crimea? Mostly from Donbass and work with their testimonies. And it's awful stories. I will never wish anybody to, to, to have this work. Frankly speaking, I have never will think that I, it will be my job uh, to work with torture cases because people told me how they were beaten, how they were raped, how they were smashed into wooden boxes, how their fingers were cut, how they are tortured with electricity. One woman told me how her eyes were pulled out with a spoon, and it's horrible. So you, you personally interviewed more than 100 people, the volunteers associated with the organization. How many total victim interviews were done? We united ever efforts with other human rights organizations uh, because it's uh, the amount of crimes which we face even before Russian invasion needed from us cooperation and working together. And uh, when uh, like uh, uh, this, my interview work started, it was done for one report, which we also do it jo- jointly with other human rights organization. And in this report, it's, it's like I was the only w- woman from among men, uh, other um, uh, like authors. And my chapter in this report was torture. <laughs> What was the scale of the documentation that that collectively these these groups, you guys and others, did? Are we talking a few hundred cases? A few, like h- how many cases did you document? For that particular report, when I personally work with people, uh, it we we gathered uh, something uh, more than one hundred. But in joint database, we have much more. Cases uh, we still don't know how much people went uh, through this hell uh, during eight years because um, when you have gray zone where the law not exist at all, it's first it's understandable you have a very like um, less information about what's going on because people are scary and people know very well that. There is no legal mechanism how we, Ukrainian human rights defenders, can help them on the uh, people who remain on the occupied territories. But second problem is that it's very difficult to calculate. Some people can be in captivity three hours, and some can be in captivity three years. But even in three hours, you can totally break a person. You can do something awful to him or to her, when and this man or women can never recover after this three hour experience. So what happened to all this material that you collected? You you 
you did uh, a whole lot of reporting, a whole lot of uh, interviews. What was done with it officially? Nobody was interested in it. Uh, what do I mean? Yes, we make official reports and send it to international organization. We work with UN, with Council of Europe, with OECE, and they, uh, the special department, human rights department in these uh, organizations, like uh, treated our report seriously, make some recommendations. Yes, we uh, send information to national prosecutor bodies. But what I mean when I say nobody care, when this uh, large scale invasion started, I was uh, reached by a journalist from different countries, and they was in huge surprise that there are such kind of cases were done from by Russia. From before? Yes. They told, wow, <laughs> we have no idea that it's happened even during these eight years. And I understand it after three or four uh, years of documentation that because it's frustrating when you speak speak uh, with people who survived after cruel torture. And, you know, you will send a report to the UN and nothing changed. And on the same time, even in the same second, when you speak with these people, another people can be tortured. And what about Ukrainian national authorities? I mean, I can understand how from the UN's perspective, where Russia has a veto on the Security Council, there's a kind of throw up your hands, we, you know, we can't do anything. Or from, you know, international European perspectives, uh, before February, people have a kind of accommodate Russia because of oil and gas issues attitude. But what about Ukrainian national authorities? What was the reaction to these reports domestically? They also uh, made their own reports. Uh, like uh, Ukrainian authorities uh, sent several reports to International Criminal Court, who for eight years provide preliminary examination of situation. But they have no real tools how to stop it. One example, we have so-called secret prison isolation in Donetsk. This uh, prison is called secret, but everybody knows about their existence. It's a torture camp where men and women are tortured to death. Uh, in each regular report of High Commissioner of Human Rights, you can find the text about this uh, secret prison. In, uh, there are testimonies of people who survived. Like the most bright one is a book of Stanislav Asseyev, which was published uh, this year by Harvard University. He, Stanislav Asseyev, is a journalist who was kidnapped because of his professional work in Donetsk, and he spent two years in the secret camp. So he described in details about system, about torture, about everyday life in this torture camp. So it was very widespread and open information, but they still functioning. The whole UN system couldn't push Russia to close it, even before large-scale invasion. International Committee of Red Cross, for all these eight years, has no access to, to the people. Uh, monitoring mission of OEC know about the existence of this prison, work in Donetsk, but couldn't reach and can do nothing. And do we know how many people are being held there or have been held there over the course of the period of time? Um, um, based on the testimonies of um, survivors, we know that if I'm not mistaken, 80 people can can halt on this uh, secret prison. And once again, I can be mistaken because too many information now. When Stanislav Asseyev uh, two years ago was in that prison, he told that 40 percent of these people were women. So now let's talk about the full-scale invasion. Everything we've talked about is from before February 24th. Now the full-scale invasion happens. You're a human rights uh, defender. All of a sudden there's indiscriminate 
bombardment of civilian facilities. There's wanton murder of civilians in, in Bucha and Mariupol and elsewhere. There's uh, forcible uh, deportations of tens of thousands of people. Where do you start as a, like, a, a, just as a person who runs a, a human rights uh, war crimes documentation organization, how do you start thinking about the task before you and what did you guys do? We immediately restore our volunteer initiative, Yevromaidan SOS. And uh, now we uh, brought up several hundred of people across the country uh, to document in war crimes because it's a huge amount. It's unbelievable amount. And it's so cruel story that even me, professional human rights lawyer who spent 20 years in human rights field, eight of them documenting war crimes, I personally haven't been prepared. Uh, we are now documented uh, cases of deliberate shelling on schools, residential buildings, hospitals, uh, theaters, uh, de uh, deliberate attack to evacuation corridors because Russia, they trample the city and they don't provide opportunity to civilians uh, for safe evacuation because they need them in the city to decrease the resistance of Ukrainian defenders because they couldn't concentrate on their task to defeat and to uh, struggle with Russian troops. They have to manage and to save the civilians who are uh, trapped in city without water, without food, without electricity, etc. We documented cases of... Uh, deliberate um, liquidation of critical civilian infrastructure. It's a tactics of war. It's a way how Russia tried to occupy cities. And also we documented different uh, crimes against civilian population, like kidnapping, uh, murder, rape, abduction, torture, and other kind of offenses. And there is no military reason <laughs> of doing these things, because there is no military reason to use tanks to have a fun firing people on bicycle on the street. There is no military reason to kill a 14 years old boy who was just playing with his ball in the yard. There is no military reason in breaking someone's house, killing the owner and rape the mother next to her nine years old child. There is no military reason in it. Russians have done all the things because they could. So talk about the, the, the scope of, of your activities in here. You say there have, you've reactivated the Euromaidan SOS volunteers. What have they been doing? They gather testimonies of victims and witness of war crimes. They made a screening because they are not lawyers, the majority of them. Uh, they are not people who have experience of documentation of war crimes. They have a very simple questionnaire and five questions. And when they underline the, the people who are possible victims of war crimes, and these people agree to speak with our volunteers, they ask these five questions. And what are the five questions? It's like about a plot, what happening. And this provides us very quickly to gather it, a lot of uh, stories of people for future analysis, because it's a screening of diseases. It's not like evidence of war crimes. It's information um, from legal point of view, which can provide us uh, in future the evidence of work. So it basically creates a database of, of incidents that maybe should be investigated further that then a more formal war crimes investigation can access to figure out who possible witnesses are. Yes. And we have on the stage their contact and can read them further for more detailed questionnaire. Also, if people have some photo, video documents, and they can provide these uh, materials to us. We also downloaded it uh, in this database. So it's one approach how to deal with all this hell which is going on in my country. But another approach uh, we also use 
And we um, united with other human rights organization, majority regional ones, in initiative which is called Tribunal for Putin Initiative. And we use more sophisticated methodology because it's trained people. So we send mobile groups to work on the ground. We uh, work with open sources like Bellingcat do and verify information uh, over the Berkeley Protocol. When we made testimonies, it's more like a, uh, like professional uh, gathering uh, of uh, testimonies. And working together, uh, we uh, have been collecting more than 7,000 of cases. And it's only a top of iceberg because 1 million people were deporting. Soon or later, uh, we will have the stories of these people in our database. So how are you distinguishing between these two categories of activity? On the one hand, you have a a professional set of investigators on a certain group of cases, and then you have just casting a very wide net to potential victims for screening statements on the other. How are you choosing the cases to to, uh, invest serious investigator time in now? Mm Mm-hmm. When you face with something which you have no resource to uh, respond, you have to be creative. So formal institution like our human rights organization, uh, like an entity, is not effective when you have Russian invasion on several directions and every day hundreds and hundreds of war crimes uh, possibly can be committed. So we use a logic of creation legal ecosystem where we have different uh, stakeholders who fulfill different roles. This volunteer initiative made screening, and future we will analyze what they gathered, what is appropriate for legal purpose, and what will remain only for national archives, like voices of people in the war, because it's also essential. It's also really important. Yes, You know, that's the whole, a huge amount of the Holocaust Museum in Washington is just you know, that, it's testimonies of, of they have this huge archive of, of, of victim testimonies. And, you know, it's a really important historical set of materials. Exactly. Like uh, this initiative collect uh, more proper evidence which can be uh, used in a court in different levels. I mean, international criminal court or national courts. And we have a lines and cooperation between these different stakeholders. What do I mean? Uh, Now we very close cooperate with uh, the General Prosecutor Office. For example, uh, we have one database of people who were kidnapped in occupied territories. And this database, we have several hundreds of cases. And when we spoke with relatives, we asked them, do you want us to send appeal to uh, UN Working Group on Enforced Disappearances? Do you want us to send the appeal uh, based on Article 39 to European Court of Human Rights? Do you want us to open a criminal procedure in national law system? And if people say yes, we do it. And how we do it with General Prosecutor Office? We have a signal chat and we uh, like exchange information in secure way, not through the official letters. So it's not mailing like in peaceful time, but very quickly. And just to be clear, the prosecutor general in Ukraine is roughly the same for criminal purposes as the attorney general in the United States? I'm not very familiar with the system of uh, uh, United States, but uh, the responsibility of investigation of uh, international crimes in Ukraine is uh, uh, covered by several uh, state bodies, but main main uh, like uh, driver and main responsible is uh, Office of General Prosecutor. So I look at this and I say, you know, Every news reporter who walked into Bucha or Mariupol, not that they were allowed into Mariupol, but came out with video of unbelievable crimes. This is just the tip of a huge iceberg. You say you've 
already looked at 7,000 cases with substantial detail. Who's going to prosecute all of this? How are we going to... Uh, the volume is unreal. It's unlike anything that we've ever dealt, tried to deal with before in real time. Honestly, World War II does not give us a very good model here because those took decades, some of those cases, and a lot of people walked away. How do you imagine accountability for war crimes in Ukraine, both over the last eight years and the ones that are taking place as we're having this conversation right now, how's that accountability going to work? It's my advocacy task here in Washington, because for all these years, I spoke with ordinary people who were kidnapped, tortured, who were witnessed how others were tortured to death. And they provide me their stories with the hope that the justice will appear. Even this justice will delay in time. So my task is, I'm not historian. I don't want only to document. I want to help to make this justice happen. And this is very important for me personally. Because I had another examples. Our brilliant Russian human rights colleague from Memorial. A memorial is an organization which was founded by Sakharov. A Nobel uh, Prize award, award we're, When we are right across this, right around the corner from Sakharov Plaza, where the Russian ambassador's house is, it was renamed Sakharov Plaza during the Soviet era. Kremlin closed this uh, organization this year. And my colleague from Human Rights Center Memorial is like, they have several uh, organizations from one umbrella. They had a huge database with one million cases about war in Chechnya. In this one million cases, you can clearly identify perpetrators. Maybe they're not all alive, but still you can, you can provide investigation. But no justice for decades. I don't want this to repeat. Russian troops enjoy impunity in Chechnya, in Georgia, in Moldova, in Syria, I was in Oslo uh, last week in Oslo Freedom Forum. I had a speech on a stage. And then when I come to the uh, hall, the human rights defender from Libya came to me and say, I know about what are you talking about? Russians deliberately shelling schools in my native country as well. And OK, I don't know much about Libya. And I ask Russians and they told Wagner Group and we understand each other. One second. And just to be clear, the Wagner Group is the uh, mercenary organization run by Yevgeny Prigozhin. Yes, very close uh, Putin uh, friend uh, from his close circle. So what do I mean? This impunity only encourage Putin for the new and new act of violence against new and new nation in the world, because they not only focus in Eurasia, we speak about Africa, for example, Mali and other countries. What they did in Syria, they used chemical weapons against civilians in Syria, and they have no punishment for that. So we must break the circle of impunity. So how do we do it? I mean, I, I, you've made a very good case for the urgency of doing it, but I still don't see Russia cooperating with any Ukrainian tribunal, any international tribunal. And so how, how do you actually, uh, the ICC can't get its act together to do anything anywhere. Where Where is the accountability going to come from? The problem with ICC is that they will focus only on several cases. ICC, International Criminal Court, will never investigate everything which has happened which means that dozens of thousands of victims remain the responsibility of national system. National system Ukraine, of Ukraine is not capable to manage such a huge amount of crime. So the solution is we have to create international hybrid tribunal where in one model uh, provide opportunity to work together 
national investigators and international investigators, national judges and international judges. And to bring a hope, not only for Ukraine, but for the other nations in the world where Russians committed crimes for decades, that, okay, at least on this stage, we stop this cruelty. And so what would need to happen for such a hybrid tribunal to come into existence? Who would need to, who would need to do what to make it happen? We need to have a historical responsibility of leaders of several countries who will agree uh, to create such international hybrid tribunals. And we need to have endorsement of some international organization. It can be UN, it can be EU, or Council of Europe. And we think that most preferably, it has to be EU. Once again, this war started when Ukraine declared our pass to EU. So it will be very symbolical for EU to create uh, on the frame of the EU this international hybrid tribunal and provide such endorsement. Does the U.S. have a constructive role to play in this process, or is it something that we're very far away from and we can provide kind of moral support and uh, perhaps financial support and uh, technical support, but it's kind of not something that we have uh, a direct role to play in? Uh, it's, It's a decision of each country, because country can join to this coalition and invest or they finance, or they specialist, or they like uh, working on the joint strategy, how to create this international hybrid tribunals, and how to hold all these criminals accountable. So any uh, country which want to contribute can find their own place. And as you have advocated for this model, how has the reception been both in Europe and here? We are just starting because it's my first time when I left Kyiv. I was in Kyiv all the time when Russian troops were circled Kyiv. I must admit, uh, it was very scary. It was a very difficult time. I have no fear, but it's very interesting mood when you know that probably tomorrow Russian troops will be in your city and they will kill you. And this is my first trip after several months because we had a lot to do on the ground. And now we establish this legal ecosystem of documenting war crimes. It's not work ideal, but it's a war. <laughs> there is no ideal thing in the war at, at all. And now we start in this advocacy and we asking a uh, free world to support us because now we as Ukraine, we are fighting not only for our country, we are fighting for our democratic choice We are fighting for a values of free world. And I really hope that free world will not be stand behind. So you were in Oslo last week. I assume you advocated this idea there. Is that is that right? Yes. And how was the reception? How did people respond to it? It depends on audience. Because when we speak about our colleagues from different countries, I mean human rights colleagues, it's very understandable for them because they know for sure they will not be peace without justice. All this like uh, peace talk that lets Ukraine give up some territories and close the eyes of the terror which Russia committed on these territories is not discussed in such circle because people in human rights circle clearly understand that we are fighting not only for the territory, we are fighting for the people. But when to convince the EU to get behind this. It's not just the human rights defenders yes. of the EU. It's, it's unfortunately. Vic- it's Viktor Orban. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I, I'm skeptical that even in the long run, Germany, which every day looks for a way to go back to normal as of, a, you know, a year ago, wants to set up a system in which you know, an international or a hybrid tribunal is demanding the production of thousands of Russians uh, who are responsible for 
you know, terrible war crimes over years and years and years. Do you really think that there's an appetite in the European Union for creating an institution that's going to create major friction between their relations with Russia for years and years to come? I, I mean, not, I, ho I hope you're it's right. It's not but easy task, but we have no alternative how to bring justice to thousands and thousands of people who were tortured, arrested, uh, beaten, killed by Russian troops in Ukraine. There is no other way. And I strongly believe, I'm a believer, and I'm doer as well, that we have not to forecast the future. We have to create the future, what we want to create. And what make me confident that it's a right way, not like wishful thinking, because I know for sure that we live in a very interconnected world. And there are a lot of things which have no limitation in national border. Solidarity, freedom, and human pain is very understandable. And if European politician will have no like bravery or historical responsibility to stop Putin, because if we will not be able to stop Putin in Ukraine, he will go further <laughs> because he are fighting not with Ukraine. He are fighting with a democracy as a phenomena. We will apply to ordinary people. We will apply to their waters because all my experience I mentioned, Yevromaidan SOS initiative, now working with ordinary people, prove me that ordinary people have much more power have much more impact than they even can imagine. And mass mobilization of ordinary people can change the history quicker than UN intervention. So if I were in your shoes, and we talked a little bit about this before we were recording, and I was trying to figure out which are the cases that have the biggest impact and bring justice to the most people that might be the easiest to investigate, I would be very interested in the cases that require a lot of organization. So to remove 100,000 people and deport them all over the Russian Federation requires buses. It requires filtration camps. It requires a lot of it requires a lot of people to get orders to do things. To kill an individual in in Bucha does not necessarily require any organization. And so you can do a huge investigation of a incredibly brutal but ultimately very small uh, crime, or you can do, you can focus on investigations that require a, a high degree of organization running a secret camp. Uh, and so I'm, I've been interested, or, or the, the other one is the, these orders to destroy civilian infrastructure. Those are clearly coming from somewhere, right? It's an organized activity. So as you think about these cases, to what degree are you focusing on ones that somebody gave an order to do something and, and we can identify that person? It's a very good point. Uh, one small remark. Russia only official state that they deported one million of people. Uh, you know, it's a it's one decimal point off, but it's, it's one a, it's million. A, it's unbelievable. It's, an unbel it's unbelievable. Uh, we we uh, contacted by the relatives of the people who ask us to help them to return back, and now it's also a lot of problem how to do it without documents, without money from the territory of Russia. And also, this is a linguistic point, but deport is a very sanitized word. The right word is kidnapped. You know, it's, it's, de deport sounds like there's a legal procedure or I don't know. We mean the deportation in the meaning of Rome statute yes. as a war crime. Yes. Because it's prohibited uh, to forcibly deportation. Russia has to open humanitarian corridors and to provide opportunity for people for safe evacuation, but they shall in on humanitarian corridors. You ask me about the strategy. 
we are on the now on the level of documentation, but we start to think about strategy because you couldn't investigate everything. You are totally right. We have to select it a priority which can provide us to go through the chain of command to the top military and top political officials of Russian Federation. And I have a hypothesis, which I will discuss with my colleagues and international lawyers, that we have to focus on the genocidal character of this war. Because this is a plan. When What was going on now in occupied Kherson? It's not only terror against civilians. It's also process of colonization and Russification. When they burned the Ukrainian uh, books from schools and gathered like uh, sent uh, Russian books about r- Russian history, and when they prohibited Ukrainian language in school, and uh, start to teach uh, children in r- Russian language, when they publicly told that Ukrainian nation, it's not a nation and has no right to exist, when the former president of Russia, now Medvedev, told, I, I wish all Ukrainians to vanish, which means I wish them all to be killed. It's genocidal call to kill the whole nation only because, first, We decided uh, to have a democracy. And second, we we are Ukrainians, not Russians. You mentioned earlier that when Russian troops were surrounding Kyiv, you thought they might be there in two days and uh, you might be killed. I want to ask you about that. Was that because, because everybody thought that they might be killed or did you have some particular reason to believe that they might be after you? Uh, we have a particular reason because uh, we know about uh, tactics of Russian troops in Crimean Donbas uh, eight years beho- uh, before. They killed and tortured to death um, the active minority of society. The first target journalists, human rights defenders, volunteers, local authorities. Now we know of a database of uh, kidnapping uh, people on, from the occupied territories. There are all such kind of groups. They are the first target. So there is no doubt uh, when they go to some concrete city, they will search in for some concrete active people. And yes, it was a scary situation, and I was asked even before the invasion, several times uh, to evacuate. And then when the invasion started, all our partners from different countries told, we will provide you evacuation transport, we will give you money for relocate, please evacuate, please stay alive, please. And I always respond, don't ask us to evacuate, help us to resist. So you never considered leaving? For that moment, I decided that I will stay in Kiev, where my husband stayed, where a lot of my friends stayed, a lot of my partners stayed, the uh, half of my team stayed with me. So I have no moral rights to leave. So do you, do you, there have been a lot of reporting that there were kill lists that the Russian invasion force had. You're sort of suggesting that you had reason to assume based on what happened in Donbass and Crimea that you would you were on such a list do you know specifically that you were or 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 is that just a reasonable assumption given how high profile you are and the work that you do nobody see this uh, killed list <laughs> So we know that it's a tactics, uh, but uh, who made this killed list? How they put this killed list, people in this killed list? We don't know. But what I was wrong in my assumptions, it's the second things. I was preparing for deliberate persecution. It's it's violation of humanitarian law. It's cruel. It's cynical. But it has some rationality. You have to liquidate active people who can provide uh, even peaceful resistance. But I never expected that Russians organize a terror. What we see in Bucha, it's not persecution. They don't care are you human rights defender or not. They killed everybody whom they want to kill. And this is, terror has no rationality. The only goal of terror is to break people's resistance, 
to make them so scary that to paralyze them, they will to resist. And that's why they, when they, you Putin, uh, as I understand, he failed the victim of his own Russian propaganda. He thought that he will face with uh, Ukrainian army and he maybe didn't expect that he will face with the whole Ukrainian nation. And when they un understand it, they go from persecution to terror. I have one more question and then I'll, I'll let you go. I am interested in hearing about your activities in Washington. You've been here for, have you ever been to Washington before? Or? Yes, uh, it's important capital <laughs> for human rights as well. And uh, I was uh, here uh, several times uh, before, but now when you are in war and this uh, something become much more clear to you. And now maybe it's not very understandable for people in peaceful time, but now we are very well understand for what we are fighting for. What Putin tried to convince Ukrainian people, and not only Ukrainian people, but to the whole world, that democracy, freedom, and rule of law, it's artificial things. You couldn't rely upon on democracy, on freedom, and on law in a war. The only what is matters is force. And now I can't say that I'm as a human rights lawyer have no legal instrument how to stop it. So I think that it's very dangerous world where human rights defenders can't stop the atrocities in a legal way. When the only methods how to stop it to ask for heavy weaponry which we are asking for to to provide to ukraine and i think that the only positive result of this situation is has to be make visible for the a lot of countries that we need to do something with our international system in, of peace and security, which now lays in ruin like Ukrainian Mariupol. Because when I spoke with international organizations, they always respond, we can do nothing. Putin is bad. Okay, I have no doubt about nature of uh, Kremlin regime, but maybe something wrong with you that Russia live in a world where she can invade it, Ukraine and do atrocities for months and you can do nothing. Maybe something wrong with international system. And that's why here in Washington, when I meet officials, uh, journalists, ordinary people with whom we discuss situation in Ukraine, I always emphasize on justice because we need not only to rebuild infrastructure after the war, we need to rebuild a belief that rule of law exists. If there's one thing that Washington can do for human rights and uh, uh, accountability in Ukraine, what is it? In short term, we need heavy weapons and such level of economical sanctions which can stop ability of Russian economy to feed this war because we need to survive. But in long term, we need justice. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode was the intrepid Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. Hey, folks, if you are not already a material supporter of Lawfare, you need to just correct that. You need to go to the Patreon page, patreon.com slash lawfare, and become a material supporter. You'll get this podcast, Rational Security, ad-free until the end of time. You'll also get all kinds of other uh, subscriber-only benefits. And most important, you'll know that you are part of the solution, not a free-riding part of the problem. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.